uh, we're going to talk about um, Judaism and Islam. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I want to stay with Christianity and the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. So many, so many centuries ago, thousands of years ago, Isis, Horus, and Osiris were thought of as a Holy Trinity. By whom? Uh, by the Greeks. Uh, the names Isis, Horus, and Osiris are Greek names. They're Greek names for African personalities. Now, we mentioned at the top of the show that, that I refer to myself as a memory recovery specialist. So let me just play that role for a second. Please do. We're here in Washington, D.C. And uh, the most obvious symbol of the capital of the wealthiest and most powerful nation in human history is an object that is known as the Washington Monument. Yes. It, was, it stands in the geographical center of what was originally the 10 mile square of the capital of the United States of America. Now that symbol is an ancient African symbol which represents the resurrection of an African king named Asar, whose name was later changed by the Greeks to Osiris. Mm -hmm. So that symbol is the oldest symbol of resurrection known to man. And I might add, uh, Rock, that that symbol was developed in Africa, principally in Kemet, the countries that the Greeks renamed Egypt, that symbol is over 6,000 years old. And it represents a man, Asar, who was the founding father of, of Kemet, the nation of the black people. And Asar was murdered by his brother. His body was cut into a variety of pieces. Uh, one story says 14 pieces and scattered throughout the land. Asar's wife, Aset, who's known as Isis to the Greeks, searched throughout the Nile River and found 13 of the 14 parts of Asar's body. She laid each of the pieces out and literally remembered her husband, washed his body with oils, wrapped his body in bandages, and created the first mummy in human history. And as she was about to bury her husband, she grieved, as any wife would grieve, because she was about to bury the man that she loved. She also grieved because, according to a story that is over 6,000 years old, a story with plenty of documentation that I see every year when I travel to Egypt, <coughs> Aset was also a virgin. And before she buried her husband, the spirit of her deceased husband, Asar, came and impregnated her. And then nine months later, the virgin Aset gave birth to their son, Heru. Now, according to some versions of the story, Heru was born 6,000 years ago on December the 25th. So we have, within the story of the founding Paris of ancient Kemet, Asar, Set, and Heru, the fundamental story that would later be incorporated into the Bible as the story of Jesus. And there are numerous parallels that, again, any person who is questioning what I'm saying, if they were to have a conversation with any uh, trained uh, priest or, or rabbi or bishop, someone who is going to divinity school, they know this story. And that is also the reason why you'll find this same symbol that looks like the Washington Monument. It was known originally as a Tekken we know it better by its Greek name, Obelisk, uh, they will find a Tekken in the center of St. Peter's Square. So you have to ask the question, what is this African symbol of resurrection doing in the center of the Vatican, and why is it that every Easter Sunday when the Pope stands on his balcony and delivers his sermon about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there are 150,000 people standing in St. Peter's Square surrounding that Tekken that oldest symbol of resurrection, and every pope knows that story. So it, it begs the issue that not only do people of African ancestry need to have their memories restored, but people of all nations need to know the greater truth of an African story that has been hidden from, from most people on this planet. In 1990, 1993, I think it was, I was at the Vatican, mm -hmm. and they took us on a tour. Mm -hmm. And I asked the tour guide, could he allow me to see the Black Madonna? Mm -hmm. um, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. Tell us about the Black Madonna. Well, the Black Madonna, there are several Black Madonnas. Uh, Pope John Paul II is from Poland, Czechoslovakia, And in Czechoslovakia, they have a shrine of the Black Madonna. So every time the Pope goes, went home, he would go and pray at the feet of the Black Madonna. The Black Madonna is the Greek version of Isis and Horus, mm -hmm. which is the Europeanized version of Heru and Aset. 
So this story that I told earlier about Asar Set and Heru and the Virgin Aset being impregnated by the spirit of her husband Asar and Aset giving birth to Heru on, on December the 25th. So if we follow that narrative, Aset was forced to flee for her life because uh, the king of Kemet, Egypt at that time, Set, was looking to kill the son. And so Aset and her son literally hid in the bulrushes. And I could take you to temples in Egypt and show you these, these imagery. Uh, these images. Um, and, and, and so she was a set and Heru were worshipped by the Greeks as the black Madonna and child. And then it was later, much later, that Eusebius took these ancient stories, took these ancient myths, and, and, and that's the essence of it. This story is mythology. It is not a historical fact, but it is a myth that is used to imbue people with a certain level of understanding so that they can relate to things beyond the physical. And so it was Eusebius who grafted these stories into the new narrative that they were creating in order to control the people physically, mentally, and spiritually. You use the term myth. Yes, sir. Would you then suggest that the birth of Christ in the manger and the Holy Trinity is a myth also? Rock, you're going to get me in trouble. Okay. Uh, that's, but <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> but let me say this. Um, I remember in 1981 reading John Jackson's book, The Introduction to African Civilization. And John Jackson was a, was a brilliant human being. He, he probably had a photographic memory, a brilliant scholar. And um, in his book, Introduction to African Civilization, he talks about the Christ myth. Now, there's, uh, there's a book called 101 Myths of the Bible. Uh, there are, uh, 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 there's a book by Kersey Graves called 16 Crucified Saviors. And in this book we find that there are 16 historical personalities that grew out of myths about uh, 16 personalities who also were the product of a virgin birth, mm -hmm. who also were born on December the 25th, who also were symbolically crucified. So what you see in, in this narrative is that myths are powerful tools that may not necessarily be true, but they have truth in them. Mm -hmm. And so it's a means of telling a historical narrative across time and space, such that everybody can relate to it. So in that context, uh, if you like, I could break down the mythological elements of the, of the story of the birth of Jesus the Christ. And it's all based on historical facts and astronomical facts. Now, I'll tell you something, as the foundation of Christianity, yes. I would like, you take a, I'd like for you to take a stab your thoughts on just that. Well, well do, and, do that <coughs> breakdown. And, and let me put this in context because uh, I was born and raised in Chicago. I grew up in a Christian household. My grandmother was probably the most religious person I ever met in my life. Uh, she took me to church, and every time I went to church, I would ask questions. Yeah. Why don't I see people who look like me in the Bible? Mm -hmm. uh, why, you know, and I asked, and she was like, just don't ask questions. Yeah, like my mom did. <laughs> and so that, that developed in me a, 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 an inquisitive mind mm -hmm. and led to me asking questions that I wasn't supposed to know the answers to. And when I, as a, a college student here at Howard, would go home and have conversations with my grandmother about some of the things that I was learning, I realized that my grandmother was not prepared for the information, to receive the information that I had learned. But because I loved my grandmother, I respected her and, and didn't try to move her beyond where she was uh, because she needed Christianity. She needed her belief in Jesus Christ in order, in order to help her uh, deal with life in Chicago in the 1960s. But what I know based on studying uh, history and science is that the story of virgin births in, in many cultures is based on mythology. We're told that Jesus was born in the manger. Uh, a manger. We're told that three wise men came to visit him uh, they followed the, the star that was in the east. Now, this is based on um, astronomical phenomena because around the time of uh, December the 21st, we have the solstice, with the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year. And from December the 21st through December the 24th, literally the sun is still. The length of the day does not increase nor decrease significantly. So the sun is still. On December the 25th, that is when it was written in ancient text that the sun, the S-U-N, was born because the day began to lengthen by approximately one minute per day. <coughs> so at the time that the sun was born on December the 20, 25th, that um, the constellation of Virgo was rising on the horizon, 
was halfway above the horizon, so it was said symbolically, metaphorically, that the sun, S-U-N, was born of a virgin. And at the same time, the stable of Aegeus was rising in the east. So it was said that the sun was born in a stable and that there were three stars that are the three stars in the belt of Orion that point to the star Sirius. Those three stars were known in ancient times as the three wise men. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the story of the birth of Jesus the Christ, it is a story of, of cultural significance, mythological significance, and astronomical significance that means three different things to people who have an awareness of the story and know how to interpret it. Again, staying with Christianity still, we're governed, Christians are governed by their code of conduct on this earthly plane are governed by the Ten Commandments. Yes. Is that the Word of God or does that come from something called the Book of the Dead? Well, um, I recall uh, James Henry Breasted, who was a famous uh, American Egyptologist um, at the University of Chicago, established the Oriental Institute in, um, I think, around 1935. Uh, James Henry Breasted uh, got in trouble for saying that the Ten Commandments were derived from the 42 admonitions of Ma'at. What does that mean? Ma'at in ancient Kemet was the overriding force that governed everything in the universe. She represented <coughs> the principles of, of justice, balance, harmony, and that there were 42 admonitions of Maya. Some of them were, I have not stolen, I have not robbed, I have not defrauded offerings, I have not polluted myself, I have not polluted the land, I have not committed um, uh, adultery, uh, I have not spoken ill against God. And so it is from the 42 admonitions of Maya that Moses derived the Ten Commandments. And so there is a profound difference between an admonition of Ma'at where one declares your innocence and says, I have not done X, Y, and Z, and a commandment where people without a profound understanding of Ma'at must be commanded not to do things that a person in their, in their right mind would know not to do. So, so these are cultural differences that are based upon another culture uh, appropriating aspects of African culture and interpreting it through their own cultural lens. Talk to us, you just mentioned Moses. Yes. So, to help us understand that you're now, you're talking about sort of the beginning of time and the beginning of man, going back into ancient Egypt, which, mm -hmm. was, which was originally Kemet. Mm -hmm. From whence come the three religions? Tell us about the development of those three religions. All right, well, as I mentioned earlier, Africa is the birthplace of humanity. Yes. No question about that. And it's also in Africa where we have the birthplace of culture and civilization. And an important civilizing aspect of all culture is how people relate to the unseen presence of the forces of creation, which we today refer to as God. Uh, so we will find in ancient Kemet the very earliest examples of people identifying with this unseen force, which we today call God. Now, the ancient Egyptians did not have a religion per se. There was no word in their culture for religion, mm -hmm. but they had a spiritual tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, the ancient Egyptians or Kemites were responsible for giving us the word amen, mm -hmm. a word that Jews use, Christians use, and Muslims use. Mm -hmm. It is a word in, in the Kemetic language which means the unseen presence of the Creator the mm -hmm. unseen presence of the Creator. Mm -hmm. And so we have within this structure a people who understood that there is an invisible force that we can't see that affects everything on life. And through a process of identifying what they refer to as nature. Nature is a term that means the principle or aspects of the Creator. M the mind of man is, is, too, is too weak, too small to understand the totality of the Creator. But by understanding the many fragments or parts of the visible manifestations of the Creator in the air, in the water, in the plants. We can come to know this force, and by knowing this force and incorporating this knowledge into our lives, we can cultivate a relationship where we lift ourselves up. So we have in Kemet the very first people who talked about a relationship with the unseen God. We have in Kemet the first temples that were built to acknowledge or to house the Spirit of God in a process, rituals if you will, for strengthening that relationship. And, and so the people of Kemet established the oldest culture known to man. It was in their day what the United States is today. 
the most powerful nation on the planet. So people came to Kemet from all over the world. People came without a religion, studied the spiritual traditions in Kemet, and then left with a concept which they then introduced to their people, which became known to them as religion. Mm -hmm. But if you look at uh, the origins of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you will see beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are rooted in ancient African spiritual traditions. I want to talk about the pyramids <laughs> after I have you to weigh in on this. I read a quote recently where Hippocrates mm -hmm. gave great reverence and credibility. Today, doctors say the Hippocratic Oath. Mm -hmm. That's referring to Hippocrates, who was often <coughs> thought and taught mm -hmm. as the original doctor. Right. He gave credence and honored in his quotes, mm -hmm. Imhotep. Right. Who was Imhotep? And well, in we, the we probably don't have enough time for you to really. <laughs> I, I do the light version. Please okay. do. Uh, in the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates says, I swear by the god Apollo and Asclepius, the god of medicine. Asclepius is the Greek name for Imhotep. Mm -hmm. Imhotep is regarded as the world's first multi-genius. Imhotep was uh, the prime minister to the king Zoser, the man who, uh, uh, Imhotep was the person who designed and oversaw the construction of the first pyramid on the planet, the step pyramid uh, at Saqqara for Zoser. Imhotep uh, was the first physician in recorded history. Uh, Imhotep was also an architect, an engineer. Before you go, before you go beyond him <laughs> being a physician. Yes, sir. A physician who had written out certain formulas of medicine that continue to be viable today. Yes, sir. Uh, the first physicians, the first gynecologists, the first brain surgeons came out of Kemet. The first uh, tests by a physician to determine if a woman was pregnant was developed in Kemet. The first test to determine the sex of a baby was born in Kemet. So if you had all of this knowledge happening in Africa uh, back at least, I would say at least uh, 10, uh, 1000 BC, then it would make sense that others would come here to learn this science and then go home and then declare themselves to be the, uh, the originator of medicine or the originator of philosophy, which is essentially what the Greeks did. But in their early writings, they acknowledged the fact that this source of information came out of the Nile Valley, came out of Egypt. I've got people in my family who hit me across my head and say that everything about that you're talking about in ancient Egypt was a pagan, was paganism. Well, all pagan means is someone whose belief is other than your own. <laughs> so in that context, to a Christian, a Muslim is pagan. You know, to a Jew, a Christian is pagan. And if we, if we think about this in that larger context, you know, the, the Jewish people were responsible for giving us uh, the Torah, first five books of Moses, uh, the Old Testament, and then the New Testament was built on that foundation. Well, no one really questions the fact that uh, within the Jewish faith, they don't acknowledge uh, Jesus as a Messiah. But no one questions them on that or challenges them on that uh, because they are the chosen people. But what most people don't really understand is that uh, the knowledge that is inherent within, much of the knowledge that is inherent within the Jewish tradition comes straight out of the Nile Valley. Sigmund Freud knew that. Uh, in the book that was published shortly after his death, Moses and Monotheism, Sigmund Freud said that the, the origins of, of Judaism uh, are, are, are Egyptian, that Moses was an Egyptian, and there are many other scholars who have advanced this work, and it's talked about in small quarters of the world, but it's information that hasn't made its way to the general public. Something happened to me.